So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Respectability's Black Excellence Filmmakers Panel in honor of Black History Month. I am Diana J. Wright, and I'll be moderating today's conversation with our filmmakers. I am a middle-aged biracial black woman with pulled back hair. I'm wearing bold glasses and a bright top. Behind me is a respectability backdrop, and my pronouns are she and her. So a bit about me, um, so you know who I am, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, introductions. My career as a ghostwriter and creative consultant spans over 20 years now. My work now combines filmmaking and advocacy for the Black autistic community using entertainment to better our lives. I'm a Canadian American of Afro-Caribbean descent here to nurture a conversation on creativity and inspiration and on lifting up our voices as Black disabled filmmakers of multiple intersectional identities. We'll be taking questions from you, the audience, during the second half of the panel, um, second part of the panel. And uh, please add your questions to the Q&A box when we ask you to do so. So let's meet our panelists. First, I'll call on Nasreen Al-Khatib. If you'll turn your camera on, please, Nasreen. Hey there. Hey, good afternoon on this very rainy day. My name is Nasreen. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. I'm a first-gen Black Iraqi disabled queer director. I was born in Oakland, California, and I was raised Muslim. Currently based here on Tongva land in LA. I'm sitting in a gray chair with an olive long sleeve shirt. I have long, curly, tightly wound brown hair. I create content for film and television behind the camera that focuses on normalizing intersectional realities. And I lean heavily in the disability, gender, and racial equity. Thank you, Nasreen. And Nikki Bailey, will you turn your camera on, please? Hi, Hi Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki Bailey. I am a uh, Black woman with pink hair, and uh, I'm wearing a striped shirt, and I'm sitting in front of a blurred background. I am a filmmaker. I am a writer, performer, director. And uh, I live in Pasadena, California. Welcome, Nikki. And Tamika Sitchin Spruce, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I am a, uh, I pronounce it she, her, her, and hers. Um, I have brown skin. I'm wearing um, like a lime. Um, green top and my green earrings and uh, long black hair. And I am a disability justice activist, independent film producer and screenwriter. Thanks, Tamika. Over to you, Erica, Erica Ellis. Hi, my name is Erica Ellis. I go by she, her. I am a light-skinned uh, African-American. Um, I have just like brownish, goldish hair, uh, multicolored sweater. I'm also uh, a Navy veteran, um, an actor, a writer, and a producer. And I live down here in the South Bay, close to the beach. Nice. Thank you, Erica. Kazmir Jasmine, you're up. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kashmir Jasmine. I am a writer, director, and producer. I um, create film and content that does discuss identity politics. I am a Black woman with biggish, curly, Afro-textured Black hair in a purple sweater uh, sitting in my living room. Thank you, Kashmir. And Juliet Romeo. Hello, uh, I am Juliet Romeo. Um, I am a brown skin, uh, Caribbean descent, I have Caribbean descent, uh, Afro-Caribbean Afro woman, sorry, I'm so I got a little uh, confused looking at my hair because I have purple <laughs> hair and um, <laughs> a, a tie-dye seafoam green, um, 
a blouse and I'm in my office in Miami, Florida. I am a writer and director. I uh, uh, create documentaries and narratives that um, support advocacy uh, and uh, disability, telling uh, disabled stories. I'm also the founder of Slam Dance Film Festival's Unstoppable Program that uh, supports and, in, and promotes diversity and disability um, film, uplifts disability filmmakers. Wonderful, thank you everyone. And I'm so excited to have this conversation today because we are all quite good friends, I think, and this is an important moment anytime we get to come together. Um, today, while we do have discussion points, um, this is a free-flowing free conversation that can't really be neatly divided. So do chime in as you like. I will call on um, everyone at least once, but feel free to talk. We have about 40, 40 -ish, 45 minutes, and I'll ask for a five-minute bell from our supporters to um, when we're when we're closing on on time for Q and A. All right. Okay. So um, in preparation for today, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about with you because we get the same sort of questions all the time. So I turned to the AI gods and I put in, um, I fed it the question, what should I ask a panel of black filmmakers? And of course I got back the usual um, points about our identities of being hurdles and what we, sh what we should do to make that less so and how do we express our culture and our filmmaking. And then I took out the word black and I asked it what to, to ask a panel of filmmakers. And it, uh, it gave me back questions about inspiration and creativity and execution and reaching your audience. And I think that says pretty much, it sums up <laughs> um, our lives as filmmakers. It's important wow. to express ourselves and our identities, but also um, we're filmmakers. Right, and it's all it's all bundled up. So I want to talk to you about that today. Um, let's start off by talking about, um, given that we see so few of our faces on screen over the years, what inspired you to pursue a career in filmmaking and in the entertainment industry? And we'll start with Erica, if that's okay. Hi. Um, yeah. What inspired me? Uh, yeah, Looney Tune um, cartoon. And go AD. on, tell us more. Well, okay, so I always wanted to be a voiceover artist. I'm still striving to accomplish that goal. But watching Looney Tunes growing up and all, you know, cartoons, I was like, I want to be a cartoon character. Um, and then when I started watching 80s action films, I said, I want to do that. I want to make those type of films. And I got it. I mean, it was, you know, it's male dominated. But I still felt as though I, I, I want to make that. That's what I'm, and I write. When I write, I write like action. I've been told I, I can write, you know, good action sequences because most people don't expect females to be able to write action sequences as if we don't know movement. Um, so I, yeah, like those buddy, you know, action comedies, Lethal Weapon, Tango and Cash, all that, that's mm -hmm. what drove me. But I, I am going to give credit to Looney Tunes because to this day, I still want to be a cartoon character. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. Um, Kashmir. Um, well, I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of TV growing up, but what I did watch was a lot of sitcoms. And I didn't know how much it impacted me until I started creating that stuff that just comes out of you before anybody else has a chance to make a comment on it. Those first thick scripts you write and those first shorts you create. And they were a different world and family matters and things like that, but filtered through mm -hmm. kind of what my experience had been, which was what is it like to be someone who has these different intersectionalities, whether it be dealing with disability, or dealing with um, being brought up or surrounded in all white spaces and making those transitions, those code switching, that the things that go unspoken. And then as I grew up in actual cinema, I realized that there were some really interesting motifs that could be used to express those that are purely cinematic, that aren't necessarily written or spoken, but truly felt. Mm -hmm. And that's what I aspire to be able to create. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, how about any one more, and then we'll we'll move to the next question, if you like. Uh, well, for me, um, yeah. growing up, I always I, I wrote a lot. I would make characters for all of my friends, and they'd want to sit around and listen to me read it. Um, so I knew that I I liked being creative, but I always say that if I if I understood and knew that this was a career uh, first, I, I wouldn't have went to uh, a school for medical professions and then try to go to medical school. Um, so it was a lot of time wasted at that part, but um, it was something that always drove me and it, it was in my, it was my passion, it was my wheelhouse. So, but when I finally came into it, it was because I was inspired by a friend to tell her story and her journey about sickle cell. And from then um, the doors kind of opened and I was able to start to create uh, more stories, more documentaries. Um, it's and interesting that you, you make me think that like how many of us thought as little kids that this was a viable thing yeah. to do or it even came know. across. Does any of us have that thought? Yeah, for, for me, yeah, I was always drawn into through the arts. And uh, since I was like a little kid, and my mom, I was like, she tells the story sometimes that I begged her to take me to an audition for the orphan Annie. Because like, I want to be Annie. I want to be, you know, on stage and stuff. And so um, I always had that, you know, the arts, choir, you know, later theater and, and those type of things. I was really naturally drawn to the arts and I did get a lot of pushback and discrimination um, until I met uh, a theater professor at community college that, uh, you know, really gave me a chance and I brought a one act play and then kind of, you know, and then got to film later on from that. So but I was always drawn to the heart. That is, that is such a wonderful thing to know where you're, you're headed. Whereas I think some of us had to go in other directions and find our way sort of here. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next question, but feel free if you, if anyone, I didn't ask that. If you want to tell that, please do uh, in a moment. Um, so I want to talk about some of the specific ways the industry could have risen to meet us. So we're, as I said, we're always um, asked about our identities as barriers and how we overcome them, right? Um, as if as if who we are is a hurdle, and practically it, it can be, but. Um, I mean, we still are here. We're still film filmmakers. We've still made our way in some circuitous route. So thinking back, what are some of the ways the industry could have risen to meet you, to make it uh, equitable, to make it easier for you just to be on par? I just want to say that even though I had um, the passion growing up that I wanted to go into entertainment, I didn't initially. So I went around about, you know, I, I wanted to do finance and I had it in my head that I get in finance, then I can finance films and then I can put myself in a film. But I didn't know a direct route. Like I didn't even, I didn't even think about classes at colleges or anything. I just figured I had to get a traditional job and then mm -hmm. hopefully work my way into that. And then I was, you know, I was on par. I went to the military to help pay for school. Then I was going to get out and um, September 11th hit and I had interviews at Wall Street and then that all changed. So I, I found my way the long way, I should say, but growing up, I still didn't know how to get there. And I think um, when I finally did, I, I, I got through um, like through another, you know, organization, a diversity hire, basically, and a um, program. And I just think that if people put put it out there, like I've met people who are disabled now, who still haven't told the people that they work with that they're disabled. Like I'm not yeah. a parent. And I've met other non apparent people who mm -hmm. don't even tell their staff that they mm -hmm. have you know, diseases. So it makes it hard for me to think that I can stay in this business, let alone get in it, because mm -hmm. 
I had always had a fear that if somebody found out that I'm sick, they're going to fire me. I think what, what the, uh, the representation, what they can do, what the industry can do is could have done to help us is create representation, exactly what mm -hmm. we're trying to do now, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like if I saw myself uh, or I saw that there were writers and directors uh, growing up that looked like me, um, then I would have believed it. I'd have been like, yes, this is what right. I wanted to do. Right. Like, honestly, I think I, I not even, yeah, I wanted to become a doctor pretty much out of revenge because I had a doctor that stuck me all the time when I was three. So from the time I was three, I've been saying I'm going to be a doctor. Right. But that's really because that's the main thing was my illness and hospitals, uh, doctors, nurses. That's what I was exposed to. So that's what I knew. And that's what's like, OK, that's what you do right? Then that's something my mom decided to do, which by the way, she became a nurse because of, you know, she needed to take care of me, right? So this was all the exposure that I had and, and not a person that's saying, not any family members uh, saying, hey, they always complimented me on my writing, my poetry, anything I did that was artistic, but they never told me I could place it somewhere. And it was probably because mm -hmm. They didn't know either coming from a, you know, Caribbean family, uh, you know, they, they come to America and they're like, we're, we're going to go work. We're going to do this. We're yeah. going to, you yeah. know, basically, and the safe jobs are like, you know, in the medical field. So mm -hmm. become a nurse, become a doctor. Right. And mm -hmm. they're all over my family. So it was the only thing that I knew. Um, and it wasn't even that I was being pushed to do it as much as I didn't know that there was right. anything else. so I, mean I think what you're saying is I think what you're saying is that not only representation on screen but representation in terms of seeing a pathway to being what you can be absolutely yeah um, I, I also think it's important to um one of the things that I, I wish had happened for me is if there were people in the industry who were interested in mentoring more um so not only the representation but um but the relationships once you're in the in the industry. So um, I, my first job in television, there was only one other person of color on the staff. And she literally said to me, don't close my office door. I don't want them to think we're in here conspiring with each other. And like, it was really, it took, it took years to like find another person of color that I could work with, you know, that was working, you know, working with that, uh, I could be friends with that, you know, um, that I could build relationship with. So like, and one of the things I think is so great now is that, you know, we all help each other, you know, like we're, we're, you know, we, we send each other resources. We, you know, we introduce each other to people. And I think that's one of the, 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 the beautiful gifts of like an organization like respectability, bringing people together so that we can sort of build community and relationship so that as new people come in, as we advance in our careers, we're, you know, helping each other and helping new people who are coming in as well. Absolutely. And not just mentorship um, on a, on a, it's like we also need to see those who've come before, but there's so few, there's so few of us um, in, in senior positions or positions of, of power is what I'm looking for, um, to reach back and give us a hand up. It's, it's because this is becoming so new, we're in this place where, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's, it's almost majority peer mentorship helping lift each other up um, which is fine which is good um, but it, it's it's not what others get to experience I think for a lot of people um, okay um, I think when people think about hiring we know that there's inherent bias and mm -hmm. um, that's that's a really uh, big barrier um, in terms of getting folks hired, especially in terms of leadership positions instead of support staff. I've, I've worked in so many different um, positions where they're sort of, um, I was hired because they were for, kind of forced to like bring someone 
of color on board, bring someone, um, bring a woman on board. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not always the most comfortable. Um, but then on the other hand, um, I look at folks that have hired me in the last few years who went searching for something different. So my, someone that doesn't look like them, someone that's not reflective of their own upbringing. And that's, I mean, I look at those situations and I kind of dissect them and I'm like, you know, where did you find my work? What made you want to reach out to me? Um, that, that is really what I want to share with, you know, more executives is, is step outside your comfort zone. Think about why you're hiring, who you're hiring. Do they look like you? Did they go to the same school as you did? Did they come from a, the same sort of uh, suburban town that you grew up in? Um, when you look at other people you're hiring, what makes you uncomfortable about that person? Mm -hmm. Ask yourself these questions. It's not an easy question to ask yourself. But if you ask it, at least you're, you're now leading towards, oh, this is why I'm thinking this person's a safer bet than this person. Yeah, I 100% agree with uh, what everyone said, in particular with Nazarene, they resonate with me uh, because I came into film uh, specifically during uh, 2010 when um, here I'm based out of Detroit, Michigan. So Michigan had the film incentives. It's so all like major movies and studios and everybody was coming here to Detroit to do film and TV and such. And that was one of these that I've learned or that was told to me that, you know, people hire uh, based on people they already worked with. It was kind of like a good old boy club mm -hmm. per se. And so unless you don't, if you don't know people that's hiring or know people that's in the industry, there's no way you're going to be able to get in really like that. So, you know, I, uh, as a result, I was able to, I took a class that got on the set, you know, that, that was part of the field of taking, you know, the film class, but that was one of the things that they really focused on. So I want you to agree that's really to, you know, go outside your network and, you know, hire people who are different. Which is a risky proposition, right? Which is why people don't do that already without being pushed to do so because a known quantity is safer for your job, for your reputation and all of that. Um, but we do need, we do need people to make those introductions, even if um, they're not going to be involved ultimately, make those introductions, reach out and beyond your circle. And, and just like we're talking about, um, make those connections that we are not able to make for ourselves because we're not in those established circles yet. Um, so let's let's move on and talk about your artistic vision a little bit. Uh, how do you balance your view of the world that you want to put on screen with these um, conditions we're talking about, like risk aversion and uh, even DEI quotas, those sorts of things that are on top of our just the already difficulty of getting your vision on screen? Does that make sense? I was a little circular, but Kashmir, what are your thoughts on that? I, I identify with that in almost a painful way. I think that my experience has been very split. So you have the work that I feel like I've created on my own or with my community. And there is this purity of vision that you get to just put yourself on the screen. And it was at respectability where it was actually watched by a group of people to see the every to see people nodding and laughing. That was the first time I thought, oh wow, I was able to reach inside of my brain and like suddenly people saw it. And then to go to other experiences like where we are dealing with studios and we're dealing with executives and we're dealing with people who have an idea of what it should look like. And it's a, and I hate to say it's a lack of trust, but it is that they have a formula that they know has quote unquote worked mm -hmm. for them. And it's often somewhat exclusionary or often may be overly conservative. And 
the balance is knowing what you are going to try to fight for and what you can compromise on because eventually building that relationship is they will start to trust your instinct and also to never stray completely from those opportunities to have your purity of vision because that's what they're trying to buy they want your lightning in a bottle even if when they have it in front of you they want to try to filter it towards in something they think they recognize so it is continuing to show that your lightning in a bottle is bright and worth pining for and working with and proving in the end that in the this was not only beautiful and profitable but unique and really reached not just the audience you're used to reaching but an audience that's even broader than that I love that I love that and there have been instances especially recently where blockbuster films have come out and made massive amounts of money but then where's the next one and where's the next one um even I say that because we're fighting as independent filmmakers but even those massively funded and distributed worldwide blockbuster projects still um, are one in a very, you know, long, long interval. I can't help but there was both relief and a deep, deep sadness when I heard Viola Davis speaking on the breakfast mm. club about just getting people to do hair and makeup and that it was always mm. going to be a fight and that you'll always have to push no matter who you are, how high you go. And then to also watch that they never received what I believed were awards. I walked away from the screening at TIFF and I there it was an uproarious crowd and people were like, this is the real Marvel movies. We need more of this. And, and to still have a whole industry not truly recognize it, it's both... <laughs> it puts makes me pause makes me a little bit afraid but then it's also then we just have mm -hmm. to continue pushing those doors open but exactly. it did make me feel good to know we weren't alone that someone as big as viola still had to work that hard yeah um how do you keep that from affecting your creativity when you're just sitting down to even conceive of a project how do you how do you keep the fire alive knowing that? That's such a good question because yeah. when you just said uh, cashmere that it made you feel, you you felt a little sense of relief that even uh, Viola Davis has the same struggle, right? But for me, it's like, oh my gosh, Viola Davis got a struggle. I don't, that means I have to do it too. That means when I get to Viola Davis status, this is what I have to look forward to. Like, that is what waved across me. Maybe my anxiety is different than you, but that's what I felt. And I was like, okay, yeah. no, what? So it's like, what can I do to make sure that the person behind that I, I feel like Viola Davis already gave us the gap was probably longer for her. It's not going to be as long for us. And so if we can keep pushing to and get to where, uh, you know, these other uh, amazing uh, Black black women and Black artists are doing for us and kicking these doors open. It took them longer to do it than it's going to take us because of what they did. So we need to just persevere so that the next person, you know, is not just closer, but hopefully, you know, we want to strive for they, you know, the doors being open and opened for them are like, what door? Like, I want to get to the point where there's like, what door? Just come on in. You know what I mean? Like, just create. Absolutely. I just, I want to get past trauma. I want to get past the trauma porn. I want to get to, like, like I said, I grew up on action movies. I want to write and produce movies just like those movies I grew up on but just with a you know diverse cast, a more diverse cast or a black female lead. Why can't we just be the black? I mean, the 70s, 60s and 70s, we were kicking butt. I don't know what happened between that era and now, but we were kicking butt. And then we got to the trauma. We got to the slave movies. We got to, you know, that. So I just want to get back to 
just regular movie. Just anybody can be in that movie. Just write it so that anybody can be in it. But of course, I'm going to put a Black female lead in it. But I, I just, can we just get out of, it's like a, a musician said, he can put out a whole bunch of like R&B love songs, but won't get played. But rap music putting out hatred and shooting and, you know, violence, it'll get played all day. So if I put out just a regular movie, no one's gonna want it. But if I put out, oh, I was a slave and you know, and I overcame and they're gonna put that out. So we yeah, can just overcome we, that. We gotta stick to our, our authenticity, you know? I think that's the grace that we talk about. I think that's what it was, was that they stuck to what they decided to do and how they decided to do it. And it didn't look like what you know, industry standards were, but they didn't care. They just did it anyway and kept doing it. Like, I have to remind myself that all the time when I look at something and I'm like, oh my God, this is like nothing I see on TV right now or nothing I see. And I'm, I have to remind myself, like, it's not supposed to, you know, it's not supposed to, because it's yours. That is that person's and this is yours, you know? Um, I had this guy tell me one time, like, I was telling him about a story I'm, I'm working on. And he's like, oh, that's been done. No, it hasn't. It wasn't done by me, you know? So, I mean, no one says stop putting out phones, you know, or stop, you know, putting out anything that someone all has already done. And it's not even about doing it better, but doing well, it and you let's may talk about that. connect with someone else. Let's talk about that for a minute. That's a great point, Julia, yes. about, about pitching our projects and being told we had one of those already, or it's not, it's not black enough, or it's not whatever enough, or you know, we had a woman director, it didn't work out, so blah blah blah. Um, not, I'm not asking you how to change that because that's not our job to change that. Um, but what would you like to see? What would you want to happen? Like, how would you like those conversations to go down while still honoring who you are? Yeah, so I, and I will add maybe a little bit more to the previous conversation, but just, you know, listening to everyone, uh, you know, from my point of view, and I'm coming from, you know, like a grassroots, because, uh, you know, being a disability just activist and working in nonprofit and advocacy, so I'm really like grassroots level type of person in my thinking, and so it's like, you know, when, when, it's best to be, you know, passionate. And even if you get the no's, it's just like if you're passionate about it and it just keep you at, up at night, like this story has to be told, I would just encourage people just to do it anyway and to, and to build partnerships like with community and, uh, you know, and, go, and, and make movies for the community. And, and people would appreciate that and they would support it, and then it would create, hopefully, so much like a fireball that the industry had to take notice. Similar to like with Tyler Perry, I know the people were like, oh, Tyler Perry, but you know, the way he did it, he, he was, and I remember at the very beginning, you know, he was doing the plays, going to like churches, going to different places, and you know, he just built a community of people that loved his work. And it just came to the point that Lionsgate had to come, you know, was begging at his door. And now yeah. he's, what, like a billionaire? It's so, so he's just, you know, if you're passionate about telling the story, yeah. just tell it, build that community, and do it anyway. I got one. And we do have to, to shout out to the Black filmmakers who are doing that. Um, yeah. Most yeah. most successful actors do have production companies that they're, um, and and many of these places have initiatives. And but you know it's it's for one or two people a year because they can't take on too many more because they also have to pay for things. So it's it's like we're doing well within our communities. It's outside of that that it's letting us down a little bit. Right. Exactly. Um, when is black excellence not excellent enough? I mean, I look at. I look at content like Lovecraft Country that was mm -hmm. canceled after one season. That mm -hmm. was an excellent show. That was the best TV I've seen of all TV in the last 10 years. That was 
incredible writing and character building. Um, look at High Fidelity. High mm -hmm. Fidelity took a, a unknown, this was Huge not a living. risk, right? Mm -hmm. High Fidelity was, you know, a success when it first came out. It was a success when they redid it with a Black woman lead. It was hilarious. She was hilarious in that. And no season two. What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, when is Black excellence not enough to just keep going? Because everyone I spoke to loved Lovecraft Country. They loved High Fidelity. Maybe not as much as me, because I finally got to see a representation of myself on screen. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, good point, Matthew. Um, Nikki, it, it's, it's on my mind that I know I know you work a little bit um, in comedy, and I, if I remember correctly, I remember you saying something like people coming back to you with um, the, that they read your work and don't get the jokes, and the jokes aren't for them. Do you know what I mean? Does it, am, am I? Can you talk a little? Yeah, bit about I mean, that? you know, I write for the people. I write for my people. <laughs> And right. and so and so the jokes are not necessarily for everybody and everybody's not going to get them. And so, you know, I I I have a, a pilot that I put on the blacklist or and 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 it got reviewed and I could tell that the reviewer was not a person of color, was not a black person, because they didn't get like they didn't get a lot of the jokes they just went whoosh, right over their head and i was like you know a black reader would have gotten those jokes and and it's it's one of those things where um where the the cultural significance of the writer is is as relevant should be where 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 the cultural significance of the writer is as is relevant to the reader and it and it should be that that should somehow be part of the the process of evaluating the work that you know we um we don't we don't read um we don't read in a vacuum we don't experience entertainment in a vacuum we don't you know we don't we don't watch television in a vacuum we watch it all through the lens of our own experience and and it matters to know you know who's who 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 created this where does it come from what is it born out of and yeah. um and that makes a difference to how we then take it in so exactly. so yeah i don't i don't i don't write you know like the jokes aren't universal and that's okay it's you know everything's not for everybody and and what we what we what we're finding out when we, when we see a lot of shows can't when we see shows like um um lovecraft country you know canceled or you know they just canceled south side on 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 netflix you know when we see shows like those get canceled what we're seeing is that they don't value black audiences um and so uh and so that, that which means that they don't value black artistry in the same way either. Right. It brings up the what is the standard we're being measured against question. Like if if you're submitting your work or presenting your work to a production company, but they don't have representation in the company, they're measuring us against some other thing that is not even that's not the audience that we're talking to. So there's that as well that we have to sort of coax our way around with every project. Yeah. I think there is, or there are subsidiary production companies and pods that are trying or are interested in the content that we have. I think like with the Onyx Collective at Disney, with all black streaming with, I think Paramount has one too. I don't want to speak to it like it's the next coming because I do fear and we should fear and be very aware of ghettoization of it, of being paid less or what goes with that ability to finally be distributed and have 
access to an audience that appreciates us and also have a production company slash studio that also values us. But it is once again, an opportunity. And I do don't want, and I want to connect that to some of the reasons why we had 60s and 70s were crazy. The 90s, why we had these, because we didn't have to, or they didn't think we would, and we didn't have to compete with all of that, those audiences. They were happy to have the niche black content. And I think they ignored the broad appeal, except for when they were stealing it from Living Single. But and I think there is, I think there is just, there are opportunities, but it comes with a double-edged sword. Yes, yes. Um, we have a few minutes left. We haven't really even touched on um, our disabled ident intersectional identities, right? On disability. But let's think about um, emerging filmmakers of all ages, all locations, people with this burning fire to be creative, right? And listening to us and um, just try not to bring them down. <laughs> but what, what thoughts do you have so that tomorrow um, when they pitch their project or conceive of a project, they they can bring themselves to the screen and feel like they can they can do this thing, right? What thoughts, what encouragement or guidance do you have? Um, hmm. Mika? I, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry oh, me? Um, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. And then to Mika. Oh, I would say, um, <laughs> it's funny because I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Oh, but, um, no. Um, to lean in, yeah, to lean into into the passion and keep and keep working because like that leaning into it and, and who you are, that's that's what I'm saying. Lean into who you are because this this identity and being honest with who I am and putting that into my work um helped me to not just love myself more. And have this self love and understanding and grace for who I am, but also that I'm sharing that with my audience, and that I'm putting it I'm putting it into the story. I'm making it my own, you know. So I say just lean into who mm -hmm. you are and, and and what the disability is, because there's a community out there that is there to support, and they also want to be identified. And with specificity, right? Like yes. go into the details. Don't just be broad about the city you right. live in. Like what is your actual life like? Yeah. That's the newness that that's always interesting. That's good. Thank so you true. for that. I just want to say wanna... I just oh, want to oh. say I did it. <laughs> sorry. I just want to say I did that's my okay. short story because um before my RA, my rheumatoid arthritis was controlled, I had a lot of flare-ups. So when I would get out of my car, I would drop my keys. And so mm. I, would, I would park and the parking lot, well, the garage was kind of dark. And so I would drop my keys and then my head, because I love horror, I was like, what if somebody were to open that back door and just like kill me? And I remember I told my mother, like, I keep dropping my keys. And she's like, you got to stop that. You, you got to watch that. So I use that. I use my experience. I use my disability and thought of, even though I put in that, you know, realm of horror, I thought of that, you know, the person, mm -hmm. you know, the character drops her keys and lo and behold, the killer gets out of her back seat. Um, so use, I mean, if, use your disability, use what you know, like make, you, I mean, I know a lot of people are like, record stuff, just videotape everything, just make everything. But some people still aren't comfortable with that. Write it down, just write it down. Or mm -hmm. like I use, you know, I use my phone to record stuff I'm thinking about I'll do a whole scene and you know just mm -hmm. burp it out just Perfect. like burn it out you know yeah. just you know if I don't feel like writing it down I'll do a whole scene and record it and come back later or just you know send it to someone and say hey listen to this so I mean just use your experience and just you know create so tell your story use the tools you have don't wait for others to give you permission any mm -hmm. last tips before we get to Q&A Find, Maybe find other filmmakers. Yeah, find right. other filmmakers that share your values. Um, it's a lot really easier different. to work with. You, can, you can't make television and film alone. You can't make it in a vacuum. But if you find production partners and, and a film gang that supports your vision, that that shares your values, it's going to be a lot easier to to get through that production day 
because they're going to they're going to be willing to take as many risks as you are. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, okay, so thank you all for that. Um, we have a couple of questions to get to. So I invite uh, the audience, if you're in the audience, please add your question into the Q&A box. Um, if you have something you'd like to ask anyone or all of us. And for our friends watching on Facebook, the comments are being moderated and questions will be shared with us here on Zoom. So one question we have so far is, what are some important stories or messages that disabled black females have made or should make or tell? So what are some important stories that we as a community need to share? Dating um, old and disabled and black, that. <laughs> you took my response, you took my response. <laughs> That's like literally what my short is, uh, what my my new short is about too, dating with a disability. But yeah, um, hmm. so important. So, so, so. I want I want to see more romance. I want to see more uh more disabled leads where they are, you know, the romantic lead. The, I mean, I as a as a programmer, uh, I have seen a lot, and I have seen action films with, uh, with disability representation. It's out there, and if it could, you could send me a short with that, there is no way we cannot do a feature film. Like, why isn't it out there? Why, like the things that I see come across, you know, uh, unstoppable. I, I cannot believe that it's not, you know, already a feature that it's not been picked up that it just doesn't make sense and so I that's what I want to see more of those the the one place you don't think you're gonna see uh you're gonna see it in a way in that way and you're gonna believe what you're seeing too because authenticity authenticity is what it's about so yeah definitely I want to no see more. a I want to see a dark comedy with a a a black disabled female lead. I don't know what it's about. I just want to see, uh, you know, like some kind of quirky, weird comedy with, you know, a black female disabled lead. And I want to star in it. So there it is. You know? <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. For me, uh, like what everyone else has said, I have said, and then also, I would say to show the humanity, you know, the, just the all, all of it, like the good, bad, and the ugly, like just the humanity, because, you know, just the, we, and of course, it's part of the human experience. Because I think, you know, when people, when you put that on screen and show the relatability and, and the, the rawness, the beauty, but then also the, the challenges, of all of the messiness of everything, you know, will be will be great. Absolutely. We have another question. Uh, when you found your passion storytelling, how are you able to practice it and continue to improve your skills? So given that filmmaking is a collaborative, money intensive uh, endeavor, how were you able to um, continue to push through all these years. That's where for me it was. I I was going to say community. Sorry, Nikki, Nikki. Having community is 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 a big part of it. Um, having uh, people who uh, I write with, uh, pet people who read my writing, who I read their writing, people that I break down movies and television shows with. Um, I'm also a stand-up comedian, so performing stand-up comedy and having the opportunity to sort of work through material that way. Um, and just continually writing, always, you know, always be writing, always be practicing that way and having the opportunity to flex that muscle is really important for me. Yeah, every everything that you said. <laughs> I knew it. So how, how about you, Nasreen? I'm thinking about um, your career behind the camera, which relies on people hiring you um, to do the big show. How how did you continue to push through over over the years? 
Always creating, um, you know, again, leading into that finding your film gang. Some of us meet peers at school. Some of us meet peers, you know, in our neighborhood um, or at work. Finding another person that maybe shares the same interest in in, in genre that you do. Um, my my entryway into the industry was through monster makeup. So I mm -hmm. found other people who were interested in that genre. Um, and we made short films together and we submitted those to film festivals. And that just kept going. Um, so, you know, each, each time you brought in your network, it gets a little bit bigger because then you're connected to a new person who's connected to an entirely new network. So just keep finding folks, whether it's through um, community activism or whether it's through school that will help you make your film and your, and your, mm -hmm. your shorts. Excellent point. And for some of us for whom finding community is difficult because their disability keeps us at home or keeps us um, as more distance than other people, uh, there are still organizations like Respectability and others that you can find your way to connect with and they will support you as Respectability supports us. So um, there's always a way, right? So we're, we're getting close to time. I think let's, let's end on, um, on an up note, shall we? <laughs> uh, thinking about the production companies out there led by Black filmmakers, uh, the films that have been coming out, um, some of the changes on, on the networks in terms of uh, packaging Black content to offer that's easier to find. What are some of the exciting things that you've been seeing? What, what excites you right now um, in the industry? And if, if nothing's the answer, you can still respond. <laughs> I love seeing Black horror. Um, like I said, I grew up like, you know, all these movies. Black Hila was probably my favorite movie growing up. Um, but so I like, I like, you know, like Jordan Peele, like putting it out there. Like we're not, we, we can do it all. Like we can do it all. We can, we're fun. Well, we're naturally funny. But horror, you know, the ongoing joke is that, you know, Black people in horror family won't last five minutes because we'll be out the door. But to show like just different types of film, um, I like that we, we're we doing like the, uh, what is this, like the drama, like the soap dramas, like you grew up on like Knots Landing and stuff like that, Dallas mm -hmm. and all that. And we're starting to do stuff like that. And I love like, I don't know, the problem is a lot of stuff isn't being um, advertised. So I would tell people to watch All American and All American Homecoming. They're good. They're like soap operas. And I grew up watching Days of Our Lives and that's about it because I really didn't do soap operas. But I, I like that. I like that we're doing, you know, like these 30 minute, you know, shows and that they're depicting regular, you know, lives. Nobody's, you know, it's all the stereotypes. It's just, you know, people living their lives. Um, and yeah, I, th I think it's, oh, nice. it's good that we're just, we're putting it out. We're putting the content out there. Um, me, really, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tamika. Okay. Well, what I'm really excited about, um, I love like the Black Panther. I love how they how they do it with that, what they do with that. But also like Woman King. Yeah, so I would like to see, uh, you know, excited to see more content like that, showing what we were before slavery. Um, you know, so I'd like to see that more. Nice. I would like to see that as well. Cassie, I like to, what's exciting uh, you right now? Oh, I'm terrible at moderating today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Julia, go for it. I was going to say I'm excited to see uh, more uh, Black uh, and tech stories like tech uh, science that is done well, no tropes like that. I want to, I, I get really excited when I see uh those type of films in there. It's like, yeah, I just believe that this is this person, they are building this scientific robot that builds bombs, whatever it is they're doing. I believe it. Like I, I like to see us in those spaces. I guess I love I love them. I love the blurbs. I love them. Because you can't be what you can't see, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I think maybe one more, if we have time for one more. Uh, what's exciting you in our industry right now or what's, you know, what's on the horizon? Well, um, I was really impressed and excited by, because hopefully it was opening doors for the type of work I like to do, is a show called Send Help about a a male Haitian actor who's trying to rise up and is dealing with his own mental health issues. And a lot of it involves this really interesting, surreal imagery. Um, there was a great sci-fi show that got shut down before it got out, but it was called Damascus and it had a primarily Black crew and we were going to get Blank on Viv back on TV. And so, but these work exists and hopefully it'll be funneled into these other places that where they could live because I, I want to see them, you know what I mean? And then once again, yeah. I have, like, Erica, I love the horror too. And we have a, so many Black female leads right now, like whether it be Barbarian, what, Bones and All. I mean, I'm not saying they were the smartest leads, but I am enjoying seeing these Black women, like, kind of kick ass or fight it out to the end and be the final girl. So I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And even in terms of uh, cinematic vision, like, to assume that we have a limited palette that we like to look at or a limited view, like we are everything. So we can bring everything. Uh, just, yeah, I'm excited to see that coming as well. So thank you, esteemed filmmakers. Thank you for sharing yourselves with us. It's been a lovely conversation. I'm so excited that we did this. Um, so thank the, the filmmakers, Nasreen al Nikki Bailey, Tamika Sitchin Spruce, Erica Ellis, Jasmine Jasmine, and Julia Romeo. You can look up their work. I highly encourage that you do. I want to thank our ASL interpreter today, Lindsay. Thank you for your amazing keeping up with all this. That's great. Um, and to the respectability team who's also keeping up with all this, uh, Leslie Hennon and Isabel Vargas. Thank you, everyone. And thank you in the audience for joining us and for, you know, being filmmakers, keep your creativity flowing. We need you. We need your voices. We need your stories and take the advice to heart. Put yourself uh, on paper and on screen and hopefully we'll see you out there soon.